old time Hollywood murder. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. Two elderly women will spend the rest of their lives in prison. That after being convicted of murdering two homeless men to collect life insurance policies. The killings became known as the Black Widow Murders. A Los Angeles Superior Court judge handed down two life terms each without the possibility of parole. 77-year-old Helen Golay and 75-year-old Olga Ruderschmidt were convicted last April. That after they befriended two homeless men, 50-year-old Kenneth McDavid and 73-year-old Paul Vados and took out life insurance policies on them. Prosecutors say the women then killed the men in murder staged to look like hit-and-run car accidents. They say the women collected $2.8 million before the scheme was uncovered. In the 90s, two killers roamed the streets of Hollywood, California, but they weren't the type of murderers that you might think of when you think of, like, an archetypal threat. No, they were certainly not. You had to watch your back if you were down on your luck in L.A.'s Hollywood Boulevard because you might fall prey to 75-year-old Hungarian immigrant Olga Rutterschmidt and 78-year-old Texas landlord Helen Gole, known as the Black Widow Murderers. We're going back to Hollywood. We're going back to the 90s, although really this case goes back much further than that. Hollywood's back open again. Hollywood's back open for biz. Yeah, temporarily. On... June 21st, 2005, at midnight, a 50-year-old homeless man named Kenneth McDavid was found dead in an alley behind a Bristol Farms in Westwood, which is a nicer area of the west side of Los Angeles. There was blood near his head, and the medical examiner would say that he died of injuries, including lacerations to his spinal cord and scalp, three broken ribs, and a fractured pelvis. A toxicology exam found enough prescription sedatives in his system to be very, very tired, if not fall, completely asleep. Get, go out of it. His death was attributed to a hit and run. On further investigation, an ID card in McDavid's pocket led authorities to an apartment building on Cherokee Avenue in Hollywood. Which, do you know where that is? I think I, I know exactly. I walked by Cherokee many, many times. Uh, there's an old, like the Second City Training Center is there. There's a lot of touristy areas. There's also a hostel. The YMCA, I believe, is also in Cherokee. Uh, The manager of the complex says McDavid had lived there for a few years but had recently moved out and that his lease was signed and rent was paid for by a woman named Helen Gole. Helen Gole was born in Texas in 1931. She wore her hair up in a bouffant. She was always very done up all the time, lived in a $1.5 million home in Santa Monica. She was a successful landlord, West Side based, and she owned three different properties that she would rent out to a lot of West Side young up-and-coming business people. The authorities contacted Gole, who said she was McDavid's cousin and the next of kin. She identified the body at the morgue and paid for him to be cremated. McDavid's death remained unsolved until Mutual of New York investigator Ed Webster showed up to get a copy of the incident report. Mutual of New York had issued a $500,000 life insurance policy on McDavid. Webster said he had been calling the beneficiaries who had just filed the claim, Gole and another woman, 72-year-old Olga Rutterschmidt but had not heard back. So enter Olga Rutterschmidt. She was born Olga Papp in Budapest, Hungary in 1933. She left Hungary in her early 20s during the country's failed bloody 1956 anti-communist revolution. She moved to LA, married, and bought a coffee shop in Los Angeles with her husband. After they divorced, she moved to Hollywood in the 1970s, where she lived by the Chinese theater. She was described as having a thick European accent. She was kind of flighty, Uh, She took life a little less serious. She was less formal than her friend, Helen, who was a friend of hers for 20 years and with whom she volunteered at the Hollywood Presbyterian Church. And they had a really strong relationship, always being there, um, helping others. They had a reputation for being kindly, very personable and very embedded in the community kind of a thing. So like, what would, you know, what would the threat look like? These two nice looking older women who just wanted to help Hollywood homeless people? Well, I mean, you have two things. You have one, their age, Mm -hmm. and then also it's that they're women. So you might assume they're the least threatening and Mm -hmm. the last people you want to look at beside being older. Not to say that women commit... I, I've seen the ID channel. Like I know you have, yeah. I've seen You've the ID seen channel. Snapped a couple of times. But there's a couple. Mm-hmm. Those are two levels where you wouldn't maybe automatically assume. Yeah. 
Exactly. And so they had all these things going for them. I can like picture them. There's pictures that we'll put up on the Instagram. They look like everyone's grandmothers. You know, they they look very, very kindly. Um, So anyway, Webster looked deeper into the health insurance policy and realized it wasn't the only one in McDavid's name. A a second one surfaced, also worth $500,000, again with Rudder, Schmidt, and Gole as beneficiaries. None of the policies mentioned Gole, who was related to McDavid at all, which is something she said when she picked up the body. Instead, the forms indicated that Gole and Rudder, Schmidt were investment partners in McDavid's screenwriting career. As he looked further, a colleague in the West Traffic Division recalled working a similar case in Hollywood back in 1999. Paul Vados, Vados, a seemingly homeless guy killed by a hit-and-run driver in an alley loaded with life insurance policies. Vados was a 73-year-old Hungarian immigrant, a widower, and an alcoholic who lived alone in Koreatown. Gole and Rudder Schmidt had come forward to report Vados missing, too, before claiming his body as next of kin. So the pieces are all coming together with these two women. And again, it's the same thing over and over. On May 18, 2006, Gole and Rudder Schmidt were arrested on the charges of felony, mail fraud, and suspicion of murder. And they got a fun or maybe disturbing nickname, too, by the LA Times, the Black Widows of the Black Widow murders. And that's something where I think also it's like Black Widow is not quite right, but the idea of the perception of somebody versus the reality of somebody is the interesting part of it. And that's really where it gets very meaty with their murders and their relationships to the people around them, immigrant status, financial status, all of that. We're going to take a little break right now. Hi, I'm Marquia. Want to hear something scary? If you think horror is a living, breathing facet of life and love the thrill of being scared like me, you have to start listening to the Something Scary podcast. Each week, we bring you a full half hour of the creepiest urban legends, ghost stories, and tales of paranormal activity. There are stories about shapeshifters, sorcerers, and skinwalkers. And our stories come from all over the world, submitted by fans like you. So you get to be more than a listener, You can also help us create our show. So if you are a fan of horror, pause this podcast right now and go subscribe to Something Scary on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss another episode. And we're back. Mm -hmm. How are you? How are you doing? Are you well? What if I just burst out in tears? Uh, I think what would you some do? people might would you be like, be like, yeah, same here. It's been a rough week, maybe for all of us, maybe for some of us. You know, it's interesting. Hmm. You know, you brought up maybe in the last week things were, I, I, you know, mm-hmm. and I saw this with uh, somebody, a mutual person, we're probably both follow like on Facebook and they uh-huh. said, hey, has this week been particularly uh, tough for anybody? Mm-hmm. And a lot of people chimed in. I think it might be across the board, but I was like, yeah, now that I think about it, like it was like a pretty kind of rough week where nothing necessarily happened yeah. in particular, but I think it's maybe the culmination. Yeah, or I think this week it was like, what is this, quarantine day 50 something? Like, I think we've all kind of hit a point. And if if someone comes up to me and tells me it's the moon, the Scorpio moon again, I'm going to lose it. No. The moon? Yeah. <laughs> How are our mayors doing? Hello. Hello. Brandon Gaddis. Mm-hmm. Chris Witt. Mm-hmm. Paige Cornelius, Ooh, hello. the new mayor. And, yeah. yeah. How's she adjusting? How's she settling in? Does she like her new office? Yeah. So, um, are Owen and Chris treating her? Everyone gets a corner office if you're a mayor. <laughs> we will have so a many corners. new bonus episode up on patreon.com slash ghost town pod. Mm-hmm. Hopefully by the time you're listening to this, if not, it'll be in the next day or two. That sounds great. Yeah. So. I could really use a bony. Yeah. We have a TikTok. We oh, that's right. Yeah, hey, that's good. That's fun. News. We're seventeen. I mean, why not? Yeah, we're seventeen plus thirty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, plus and eight. I don't know. Yeah, don't do the math. Actually, just stop. <laughs> and the TikTok is at Ghost Town Pod, but it's doing pretty well. We're we're just doing one minute versions of some of our episodes, mm-hmm. but some not of our episodes. Yeah, and people seem to be interested. And we have a YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash c slash Ghost Town Podcast. Give it a subscribe, play mm-hmm. through some of the playlists. It helps. If more people watch it, YouTube will suggest it to more people, and then we will get more people keen on Ghost Town. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Get like, keen on it. 
Yeah, if, if, if the podcast is a meal, don't you like snacks and desserts and midnight buffets? <laughs> uh, quarantine. Not no buffets. Yeah. I think buffets are out. Yeah, that's true. Quar- quarantine accepted food ingestion. Then that's what our TikTok is. That's what our YouTube is. Jason's also just coming off of his birthday. Yeah, my birthday. Now I'm actually 18, so not 17. Whoa, not plus hello. 30, plus 8, plus kind of 6. <laughs> no, don't do the math. Don't do the math. But uh, mm-hmm. I actually, I was fine with it because I, I had the excuse that, well, I can't do anything fun for my birthday. I don't have, uh, it's out of my hands mm-hmm. instead of having the pressure of doing something. That's nice. Uh, Rebecca got me a nice gift card to John and Vinny's. Mm-hmm. Got to go over to Fairfax, which was nice. Which yeah, I the like Fairfax to do. District. Yeah. It's very fun. Um, um, got some ninety dollars pizzas, and it was. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you if you're into indulgent bullshit, and you're a friend of mine, like welcome. Yeah. You know, like here we are. There's a nice review. There's many nice reviews on Apple Podcasts. Keep them coming. Ked Gill, adorable and amazing. <gasps> Love you both. Thanks for a fun, engaging, and informative podcast. I don't know which one's adorable and which one's amazing. I'm both. Oh, I'm, can I be and? <laughs> can I be May 1st, 2020? <laughs> sure, sure, it, sure. All right, great. Yeah, Thank you. Let's get back to Hollywood. Let's get back to about two miles away from Jason's birthday pizza dinner. So these two women were arrested on these felony charges. And according to Hollywood Presbyterian pastor Chuck Suheda, uh via the NBC News, they seem like somebody's grandmother and the kind of folks you might respect. He knew them from the volunteer work at his church's homeless program. They had met during their work there and continued their crusade to seemingly help the homeless in Hollywood again for many years. And I couldn't figure out exactly where they met, but they had been working at this church for a long time, dependable, respectable, pretty normal ladies. Olga Rudderschmidt, her immigrant status seems to have a lot to do with this too, and how they got away with this. Not only them being these pillars of the community or being these elderly women or not even perceived successful, um, being fairly successful and well-to-do people. Uh, She, again, was a Hungarian immigrant, and she had a lawyer named George Brownfeld, born Einhorn, who was also an immigrant who moved to L.A. in the 60s, and he was really key. He would help them out. I think the culture around what what I've researched about Hungarian culture, especially as immigrants in California, it's a small community. Uh, they they kind of bail each other out. There's support systems. So a lot of the people in her stratosphere were those people, including her lawyer, who kept kind of sweeping a lot of this stuff under the rug when evidence of it came out more and more. And that's something, according to his son, who, who wrote this really uh, great essay about his dad and the work he did for Hungarian immigrants, including this murderer. The trial commenced. The woman pleaded not guilty to the murders of these two men and nine counts of fraud. Interestingly enough, a third homeless man uh, named Jimmy Covington testified at the trial that he had been approached by Rudder Schmidt, who had taken him to Burger King and promised him shelter. He testified that he had moved out after growing suspicious when Golay and Rudder Schmidt asked him to sign documents and give his personal details to them. By then, Golay and Rudder Schmidt had already filled out one life insurance policy application for him, so he hadn't even agreed to get help from them. And they already filed a life insurance policy out on him. So then the pieces started coming together with these two women approaching men who were down in their luck, who maybe were creatives, maybe not, maybe immigrants, maybe had substance abuse issues come to them. They saw these women as being very helpful and very active in their community. They would give them their information. Free and, Burger King. Yeah, free Burger King. You get a that's free what I mean. I, I, with cheese. I locked into that. Yeah, that's really. you're like, you're like, where are these women? Yeah. I have all this info for them. Um, they would take their information. They would help them out. They'd often get them an apartment or try to get them an apartment. Again, we don't know exactly how many people that they attempted to do this with, but we know at least three, um, probably more considering some of the other documents around this, but they've never had a confession too. So we can't really get to the bottom of this, but we can tell you that the prosecution's case included secretly recorded conversations between Goley and Rudder Schmidt when they were in jail. So their partnership started to fracture as all the stuff started coming up. Rudder Schmidt told Goley in one conversation, you did all these insurances extra. That's what raised the suspicion. You can't do that. Stupidity. You're going to jail, honey. They're going to lock you up. Suspicion had, in fact, been raised when a detective happened to overhear a colleague discussing a case whose features closely remembered that of another one. So it wasn't even really them, but 
they quickly started unraveling once the case started happening and the trial. Uh, and over the course of seven years, as the jury found out, Olga Rodeschmidt and Helen Golay took out 20 life insurance policies on Vados and McDavid, netting nearly $3 million in claims. Rudderschmidt had rubber stamps made of the men's signatures to use on forms. The women were savvy. They were shopping for lowest, lowest cost insurance whose paperwork was handled solely over the phone or by mail. They were in this isolated situation where the insurers didn't really ask any questions or do any more research. With all the policies, 24 months had to pass before the coverage became virtually incontestable. In essence, authorities said these deadlines became expiration dates on the men's lives. But as these schemes played out, they both became adversarial, again, almost competitive, these two women. Though Goldie and Rudderschmidt worked as a team, there was evidence that often one of them did more or they weren't quite privy to each other's activity. Of the 13 policies on McDavid, for example, Goldie was sole beneficiary on eight. Sometimes they tried to remove each other as the co-beneficiaries to get all of the money for themselves. Regardless, insurers sold policy after policy and paid up more and more. And as the policies happened on these two men, like we said before, like they, that's when they had to be killed in order to deliver on this money that went to one or both of the women. Both Goley and Rudderschmidt were convicted in April 2008 of conspiracy to murder of Vados and McDavid and a first degree murder of Vados. Goley was convicted of the first degree murder of McDavid. Convictions on the several counts spanned a week because one juror had to go on a trip and was replaced by an alternate. The original jury reached a deadlock over the final two counts against Rudderschmidt, but after the alternate juror was introduced, the trial judge ordered the jury to recommence deliberations. Both women were sentenced to consecutive life terms in California federal prison without possibility of parole, which isn't that long. They were already quite old. It's not super satisfying because they never confessed to anything, and, and you could see them kind of fracture and fall apart in some of the recordings that people used in their case, but they were never like, we're going to lay out the scheme for you. Most of it is pretty evident, but they were just greedy. They were already successful women. It kind of felt like as I was doing research on this, that it was more for sport, if that's like a perverse way of putting it. Yeah. I mean, power and the excitement, especially, you know, you like what what else do I have to give at age 75? Mm-hmm. I mean, I say that at every age on that. Yeah. But at 75, <laughs> and you're like, wait, we're really good at this. And instead of doing one or two, which would be plenty for them, yeah. it's never enough. It's like, it, sometimes, you know, when somebody gets caught shoplifting, it's mm-hmm. never really, when they get caught, hey, this is the first time I've done this. Sure. Statistically, that's, it's never, it's the first time you got caught. Yeah. Maybe I know from personal experience, maybe I don't, but it's, it, mm-hmm. it, the chance of getting caught the first time is pretty low. So if you, you know, just kind of get out while the getting's good, but nobody does that. Nobody does that. And and they would have probably gotten caught. I mean, this is this had an expiration date to all of this, depending on where that came from, whether it was records, whether it was cops talking to each other, whether it was them, maybe ratting someone out, like something was, was going to give. When, yeah, we have more than one person. Exactly. The thing is, though, they should minus the Burger King charges from the millions, mm, just to be fair. I don't know if the lawyer brought fair. that up. So <laughs> got a Big Mac and got you know the chicken sandwich, the, the yeah. fries. And, yeah, and, and, I mean that was just like a nice meal. You know, <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite Burger King? Ooh, you... um, I haven't had Burger King in a long time, but I love a, a nugget. I mean, I love if you give me a, a giant cheeseburger in it from any fast food restaurant i will gladly accept it so i'm gonna say cheeseburger uh if these women are listening i'm worth nothing i am nothing (laughs) but you will take those cheeseburgers oh gladly 